good. So hi, uh, I'm Eric Danielson. I'm the tech lead for the provisioning engineering team here at Twitter. Um, and so Twitter runs over 100,000 different bare metal servers. Uh, and provisioning engineering, the role of provisioning engineering is basically to build the software and services that allow us to manage uh, all that hardware. Um, so a little bit about our problem space here. Um, we're not really, our, our problems are not traditional like Twitter scale problems. We don't have like 100 million queries per second or anything like that. Um, what we do have are uh, basically a lot of, many different types of hardware here. Um, we have sort of, uh, you know, a number of different permutations on different platforms and different, you know, uh, BIOS cards and things like that. Um, we also have relatively high failure rates compared to a lot of other services you're gonna be uh, interacting with. Um, we have longer running processes, so things like, you know, we're installing an OS on a, on a system that's a couple gigs of uh, data that you're gonna lay down a disk that's gonna take some time no matter how you do it. Um, but the biggest thing that we run into is that a lot of this stuff is really not made to be automated at all. Um, so for instance, there's a, we've got a, a particular RAID controller that the uh, software to run it, every time you run a command against it, dumps out a copyright notice to standard out. Um, so, so those are our sort of problems here. Um, and really the core of what we're trying to do uh, our team is responsible for basically turning hardware into a reliable service, um, trying to create sort of, you know, the same sort of experience that you get out of something like EC2 um, with actual bare metal here. Um, so the first challenge of all this is kind of keeping track of it, talking about it, that sort of thing. Um, we, like I said, we have over 100,000 machines. Um, that's not going to survive any naming scheme you can think of. Uh, we can't do, you know, Hobbit names or something like that with that. Um, so the first system that we've built to, to kind of deal with all this uh, is a system that we call Audubon. Um, and very quickly on names. So if you've gone to a Twitter talk before, you know we like our bird names. Um, so I'm gonna keep that to two here. Uh, the man on the left is uh, John James Audubon uh, of the Audubon Society and the Audubon Guide. It's the bird directory. The man on the right is Alexander Wilson. Uh, he was the man who taught Audubon how to be an ornithologist. Um, this is the other name that we, Wilson is the other name that we've got here. So Audubon and Wilson, those are the two names I'll be using. <laughs> so back to Audubon. Uh, Audubon is our machine database. It's basically the source of truth about what is running where in the data center here. Um, it's a relatively simple application. It's uh, Django on MySQL, um, nothing particularly fancy, but it's got a couple really, uh, really nice features here. Um, one of them is that you're able to attach basically arbitrary metadata to any given host. So uh, just key value pairs of interesting information about different hosts. Um, you can also uh, query across that, that information as well. Um, you can assign hosts into different groups. Um, hosts can be part of many different groups and those groups can also have key value pairs attached to them. So this allows us to organize all of our different hosts into sort of uh, coherent ways. And so you can organize hosts into, you know, all of these are Hadoop hosts. And uh, this group of hosts is in a particular rack here. Um, and all those have different properties that are, that are sort of attached to them. Um, it's, a, it's a very simple app. It has a REST API. We have a CLI for it. We have a Python uh, library. Um, this is, like I said, this is the source of truth for everything in the data center. And so uh, Puppet uses this to determine uh, what a host should be running here. Um, most of our other config and deploy scripts rely on Audubon as well. Um, so like I said, we've got a CLI for this. This is a little bit hard to see here, but it's a very simple little uh, CLI app here. Um, you can get information about individual hosts. Uh, you can see setting attributes. You can see searching by the attributes here, um, different groupings of, uh, of hosts. Um, and it's all, like I said, it's, it's basically arbitrary. So you can take a list of hosts, assign it to a group, assign attributes to that, and then later on reference it by all of those different values here. Um, so that was sort of the first, uh, the first step towards us sort of getting our hands around all this. Um, I wanna walk through sort of the view of the host in terms of how we actually control hosts here and the, uh, and the process that we use for that. Um, this is kind of the core of the whole process here. Um, how we control hosts, uh, you, this is, this is step one in the, whole, uh, in the whole thing. Control begins with the host. Um, second point on names here. Um, we have servers that provision hosts. As you can imagine, the naming gets a little bit complicated here. So for the purpose of this talk, when I talk about a host, I'm talking about a physical machine that we're trying to run a process on. Um, the server, when I talk about that, is going to be the, uh, it's the machine that is running the code that we've written. Um, so this is not the physical host that we're trying to deal with. This is just the server is, is another service that we've written. Uh, and then the user is the person or the service or whatever else that happens to be that's uh, requesting any given action here. Um, so the first step in the boot process, and I want to go through this a little bit. Like I said, my, my goal with this is to give you enough information that uh, if you're trying to run this sort of automation yourself, you've kind of got at least the breadcrumbs that we've followed here. Um, 
We rely on uh, gpixie and a specific boot image uh, as sort of our, our control surface here. Um, and the, the key with using gpixie is that uh, gpixie gives you the option to basically programmatically create a, a pixie boot menu. Um, so the pixie boot menu for us is, uh, is allows us to basically, when a host boots up, it contacts a CGI script. That CGI script uses a couple attributes and a couple other things about uh, a couple other services we have to determine what the host should do next. This is our first point of control in, in, determining, uh, in, in sort of determining what a host is going to do. Um, if we don't have anything for the host to do, it's just going to boot to its local disk. Um, this is, uh, if, if we do have something that we need it to do, we have a specific boot image that we'll boot it into. And then we also pass any additional information as kernel arguments, which we can then recover later from the, uh, from the command line there. Um, the second step in this is, the, uh, is, is what we call the Wilson boot image. Um, so for our runtime environments, uh, Twitter supports uh, multiple different operating systems and kernels. Um, I think we are supporting three different operating systems, multiple different versions of kernels. Like I said, we have a bunch of different platforms which include a bunch of different drivers. Um, so that's all in the runtime environment. That's uh, for, for our provisioning and maintenance though, um, we wanted a single, uh, a single image that runs across everything that has a defined kernel, a defined set of drivers, a defined set of uh, scripts, that sort of thing. So uh, this is sort of our first, uh, first bit of standardization here. Um, we also have an Etsy rc.local script that we've sort of customized to download a couple other scripts and start bootstrapping uh, what we call the stage environment. Um, so the Wilson stage environment is, uh, it's a set of scripts and a set of sort of uh, helper functions and that sort of thing that we've defined. Uh, where basically the goal of this is to reduce as much as possible the boilerplate that we need to know and write to get a, pro a host to go through a process here. Um, again, this is the, the focus of this is standardization. We want everything to be as, as, as sort of regular as possible as we run through these processes here. Um, so, this, uh, so the Wilson stage environment allows us to segregate basically the, the sort of the actual process we want to run on a host, like a BIOS update or something like that, from all of our other control structures around that, that process. Um, the stage coach is the name that we've given the script that, uh, that sort of sets up this whole environment here. Um, it is, uh, it's basically a bash script. Um, it's actually our second point of contact uh, with the provisioning system and with all of our other systems here. Um, so again, the, the purpose of this is, is basically deal with all of the boilerplate. So this uh, posts timing stats about how long processes are taking, um, sets up all the environment, downloads all the little helper scripts, that sort of thing, collects the results of each one of the processes that we run. Um, and it also is where we've wound up putting a bunch of little hacks and other tricks like that that we've learned along the way. Um, things like, you know, one of these examples is, uh, we found that if a host has been down for too long, it's unlikely its clock's gonna be correct, so the stagecoach now does an NTP update. And this is just sort of the place where we put all of those little, all of the little fixes that we need to do here. Um, the nice part about that is that because the stagecoach takes care of the entire rest of the environment here, uh, the stage scripts themselves can wind up being uh, very, very simple. Um, it's, it's just what's necessary for the individual process. So what you're looking at on, on the right-hand side there, um, this is basically, this is a stage script for doing a disk wipe. So when we dispose of a server or something like that, we'll run through this process here. It's about 67 lines. The sole purpose of this script here is to run through the process, to wipe disks, and to keep track of that. That's all this script actually needs to know about. Um, we use exit codes to indicate what, uh, what happened and what the next step should be. We've got a couple other little helper scripts around that. But basically, this is, this is the entirety of what we need to, to do a disk wipe here. Um, this took us about 30 minutes to write this and deploy it. Um, and so this, this environment gives us a lot of flexibility uh, to sort of move very quickly here and, uh, and write new scripts. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is sort of the server side of what supports this, this sort of host-centric environment here. Um, and this is actually winds up being a really incredibly simple uh, sort, of, uh, sort of support setup here. Um, and it's actually so simple I don't need a section, I can get away with just a slide on this. Um, it's static files and Apache serves everything. We have a handful of little uh, CGI scripts, things like that, but for the most part, uh, this is a really, really simple uh, side of our environment here. You can actually see on the right-hand side, this is all that's delivered to the, uh, to the Wilson host to actually, uh, or to the Wilson server, to actually support this environment here. Um, there's one other little thing that we've done with this, um, which is that we have another, uh, another sort of uh, uh, grouping of files that we call the Wilson resources. Uh, the principle with this was that we, uh, you know, you have BIOS update scripts, you have a bunch of burn-in applications, disk layouts, things like that. These are things that our team doesn't really own. Um, we don't really have... Uh, we're not, we're not, we don't want to stand in the way of the teams that own this. So Hardware Eng handles about half of these things here. Um, the principle behind this is basically get out of people's way. These are the same things though. These are basically bash scripts. These are basically served by Apache here. Again, all of this stuff is as simple as we can make it. 
So that's basically the, uh, for, for just handling specific hosts, that is, that's, the, that's the entire scaffolding there. We've got, uh, like I said, a boot image. We've got, we use Pixie to control what the host is actually doing there. We've got the stage environment, and we've got a bunch of Bash scripts. On top of that, we built a few uh, user-facing services here as well. Um, so the first one of these is what we call the Wilson API. Uh, the Wilson API is basically, uh, this is our, our server automation tool here. So this is basically, this is the, uh, the primary tool that, that SREs use to kind of control their servers here. Um, and the way this works is that a user will uh, send a request in that says, okay, I want my host to do, you know, go through a BIOS update, uh, format all your disks, uh, reinstall the OS, and then you know, let me know how all that went. Um, so Wilson API uh, is responsible for enforcing permissions on that. Um, so this, is, uh, this prevents you from basically reinstalling somebody else's box. We check who the owner of that box is. We check what groups they're in, that sort of thing. Um, we keep an audit trail of every action. Whether or not we allow it through, we keep the audit trail. So even rejected jobs, we can check back in. Um, Wilson API is also, it's designed to basically be fire and forget. And so essentially, you issue the request. Uh, Wilson API will reboot the host. Uh, we've got a separate service for doing that. Um, I mentioned before that Pixie uses various other services to determine what a host should do. This is the primary one for this. So when the Pixie menu, uh, when the host checks into the Pixie menu, Pixie checks in with Wilson API, and that's what determines what the host is going to do next here. Um, we track success or failure of, of the, uh, the processes there, and we also do email or HTTP callbacks at the end of it here. Like I said, the idea with this is fire and forget. You issue a command, and then later we tell you how it went here. Uh, we've got a, a CLI called Prof Control, which works, uh, basically these are just a couple little examples here. It's a one-liner to reboot a host, um, tells you what you're doing so you can confirm ahead of time. Um, it's a one-liner to, this is reinstalling three different hosts here. You have to own them, of course, but uh, it's, this is all it takes to, to sort of work with servers in our environment now. We also try and give you as much information as possible if something fails here. Um, so we've got a lot of checks and a lot of, you know, if, if it's possible to retry and get things working, we've tried to make this as, as, as foolproof as possible here. Um, and we try and give the user enough information in a failure to actually like figure out what to do next. So in this case, you can see that the host uh, failed to boot to disk. Um, in all likelihood, the drive is shot. There's not much we can do about that. That requires a guy with a screwdriver. Um, so contact side ops. <laughs> And then our second tool is a tool called the Wilson Lifecycle Manager. Um, Wilson Lifecycle Manager is basically responsible for keeping track of hosts from the time that they enter into the data center to the time that we dispose them. Um, you can see the, the graph on the side there. This is mostly correct. I think we've got one or two additional stages on this here. Um, and the key about this is that this tracks, this does, uh, this sort of tracks two different things. And one of them is that uh, this enforces permissions here. Um, so you can see that we've got kind of this red line across here. Uh, basically, any time a host has been allocated to a team, uh, they have this sort of the upper three states in this graph here. The service owners are the only people who can, who can affect a host in those, uh, those states there. Um, we also enforce some business logic in between transitions here. And so when uh, you know, the fleet management team says they want to allocate a box to a team, they're moving it from unallocated to allocated, and that involves reinstalling the OS and setting a bunch of attributes and things like that. Um, for the most part, Wilson Lifecycle uses other services to do all this. Um, it'll call out to Audubon. We, use, we have some JIRA tickets involved in this. There's a, it will use Wilson API to get certain tasks done, that sort of thing. Um, so overall, what this works out to for our host provisioning flow, um, I'm just going to walk through this very, very quickly here. Uh, basically, fleet management wants to allocate a box to, uh, to a team. They request a transition from Wilson Lifecycle. Wilson Lifecycle sets a bunch of attributes in Audubon, requests a reinstall from Wilson API. Wilson API reboots the host. Host contacts uh, Pixie. Lather, rinse, repeat while it goes through all these different processes here. At the end of it, when it finishes, Wilson API tells Wilson Lifecycle how it went. Wilson Lifecycle finishes the job and tells fleet management how everything went. No human is involved in this process if we can possibly avoid it. So that's, basics, that's the basics of how we handle uh, hosts here at Audubon, uh, at, uh, at uh, Twitter. Uh, there's more kind of going on behind the scenes, but that's basically the, the, the skeleton here. Um, so a couple little lessons that we've learned along the way with this. Um, standardize everything. Wherever possible, standardize what you can. Um, we have, like I said, you have, we, have, we have a ton of different hardware platforms. We have a ton of different you know, uh, 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 RAID controllers and other things like that. You're going to have enough variety in your life as it is. Wherever possible, standardize what you can. Stay as simple as you can, basically the same reason. Um, you're going to have 
timing issues between a RAID controller and a kernel, you're gonna have as many other things as you want. You don't need to make your life more complicated. Like I said, most of our process is basically Apache uh, serving up static files. Um, listen to your users. Um, we, had, we had some very good teams for a very long time uh, who were managing these flows on their own. Um, talk to them, find out what they've done, find out what they're doing. This is how you'll find out what's actually broken in your stack, what you actually need to fix, um, and what the existing flows actually are. Make their lives easier. Um, this is the way that you get people to use the new processes. So uh, the benefit for Twitter from the new, from Wilson API and Wilson Lifecycle is that we enforce permissions, nobody can accidentally reboot a box, we get audit logs, we do all the right things. But the benefit from the user is that they go to having one command that will tell them whether or not something succeeded. Our users love this. And the last lesson for us is hardware is hard. Um, we have sleep five scattered throughout the stack because a lot of times it's just not worth it to try and dig in and figure out exactly what went wrong, what went wrong with this exact RAID controller. Um, you're gonna run into issues like that. You're gonna run into these really gnarly issues here. Um, hardware is hard, just get used to it. <laughs> uh, and the last thing is this is, a, this is a project that we've been working on for a really long time. This is the first time we've gotten to present a lot of this, but um, I mean this, is, this was five years old when I got here. Um, so these are all the different people that we want to thank for, uh, for their help in the process here. And uh, yeah, so thank you all. And uh, questions, do we have time for questions? Three questions? Uh, so the question was about uh, how do we handle out of band control, um, IPMI, that sort of thing. Uh, currently we are using uh, IPMI to contact the uh, individual BMCs. Um, we have a service that's basically dedicated specifically to that. Um, we've found that they are very, very flaky. Um, the hope going forward, and what I would, I would strongly recommend if you can, um, so what the hope going forward is that we'll actually be able to use something that is just issuing a, a pseudo shutdown dash R on the host itself, because um, I think that's gonna be a lot more reliable. But yeah, uh, we are using BMCs on the individual hosts. We are using IPMI. Um, we have individual services set up to handle all that. Yes, all of it, if we can. Um, it'll be a little bit, we've got some cleanup to do and that sort of thing, but yeah, our goal is to open source the entire stack, every, every piece of it that we can. Um, yeah, we have, um, we have a couple, uh, couple processes in that. When a host comes into the data center and goes through a burn-in process where we try and tax the memory, the CPU, and the disks as much as possible, um, that's I think about 5% of the hardware somewhere around there that we catch with that. Um, we also have a step basically before we do a reinstall and at the end of the reinstall, uh, we go through a process where we make sure that the hardware present on the host matches what we expect it to. Um, and so that's been, uh, that's caught a lot of errors and that sort of thing for us, so. Cool, uh, I think that's what I've got time for. So, uh, Ian, do I bring you back up or? Uh, no. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.